Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. All right, I've got a special video for you that I thought I would make um, because I get this question quite a bit. People ask me all the time. I know this is going to sound crazy to some of you, um, but if you've been a gun owner for a long time, obviously this is not going to be much of a point of, of you know conjecture for you. However, there's a lot of people that want to buy a gun, but they don't understand how guns are purchased. And oftentimes, too, you see that the anti-gunners are very guilty of really, you know, pushing all of this rhetoric around saying, you know, this is how guns are purchased. And they don't care about the facts. All they care about is what their perception of, of reality is. And they think that guns are too easy to buy. And I'm going to sort of go down the list of things that you have to do to buy a gun in the United States. So I thought this would be a fun exercise. And plus, people have been asking me, hey, how in the hell do I even buy a gun, Eric? You know, if I want to arm myself, what do I have to do? Well, um, so it's, it's tricky, I guess is the best way that I'll describe it. Um, it, it, it can go a lot of different ways and I'm going to try my best to kind of break this down because, you know, I did used to work at a gun store, you know, I used to work at Moss up there and I sold guns to a lot of different people. Right. And you have people come in and, and, and understandably they're going to be confused about what to do. They don't know about the paperwork or, you know, they have this preconceived notation of what it's like to buy a gun, what it's like to go into a store and purchase a firearm and because, you know, they've been misinformed by the media and, and by the education system or the mis indoctrination system is really more like it. But they've been misinformed in some way or they've gotten some bad advice and they think, you know, that it goes one way and the reality is that it goes another. So we're going to go over it a little bit and I'm not going to go into like a metric ton of detail, but um, basically firearms ownership in the United States currently as it stands is probably one of the most regulated uh, undertakings that a person could possibly ever go through, right? Now, there's a lot of regulated industries in the United States. You know, we have various alphabet agencies that are set up to sort of regulate certain industries and things like that or to regulate certain undertakings. And that regulation, unfortunately, is not really anything new, right? Because the government, at the end of the day, is a business, right? They... they, they are really, at the end of the day, they're in the business of control and they're in the business of protection. Like, look, the mafia, it's the same type of thing, right? That the government thinks of themselves like a giant sort of mafia where they go, hey, we're law enforcement, we do this, we do that. Oh, but you're going to pay us these fines and these fees and this money. Uh, and in exchange, we won't kill you. Like that. that's basically just like the mafia, you know, that businesses pay like, you know, underground crime and organized crime people, you know, protection money. That's kind of like what our government's become. Whether, uh, whether or not anybody wants to admit it or not, that's the truth of the situation. So gun control or, you know, and everything as a, as a talking point is just another vehicle for them to sort of, you know, exert more and more control and IE fees, fines, penalties, and more of a, you know, let's just say more of an overview approach to the whole process. So just know that firearms manufacturing and firearms retail are some of the most widely controlled undertakings that you could possibly do in the United States of America. I mean, period. Okay. So with knowing that, um, you know, buying a gun is not really as hard as you would think. And uh, it, it's not as big of a deal. Uh, although, of course, the anti-gunners always make it a big deal. So basically, you know, there's all this stuff all over the Internet, right? You've got YouTube videos, you've got Instagram posts and, and Facebook posts or whatever. You know, you go on social media or you saw a movie trailer of John Wick shooting the new whatever cool gadget you want. And let's just say, OK, I want this gun. And, you know, this is the United States of America. We got the Second Amendment. I can buy this gun. And truth be told, there's actually not a lot of guns you can't buy. That's another common myth that people have, right? Now, certain guns are obviously extremely expensive once you get up into like transferable class three or, you know, transferable NFA items like, you know, transferable privately owned machine guns. Yes, you can buy a machine gun. Yes, you can buy an artillery piece. Yes, you can buy a tank with a live gun and you can shoot it. You can own it. Yes, you can own cannons, right? You can own a minigun. There's a lot of things you can own, but they get more into that prohibitively expensive territory the more cool you get. And 
you know, there's just certain types of guns that are, let's just say, over the counter. The best way to look at it is more like over the counter versus a prescription drug, right? I can go into the pharmacy and I can just buy some Sudafed or whatever the heck I want for whatever ails me and I can buy it and all's good and I go home and treat my issue. But then there might be certain medications where it's like, hey, you got to go with a doctor. So that's the best way to look at it. There's always going to be a re regulatory oversight over certain classes of guns in the United States. Unfortunately, that's that's the landscape that we exist under at the moment. Now, there's obviously been some Supreme Court cases that have been, um, you know, that have gone through that could change that landscape for the better uh, for gun owners. But as it stands right now, uh, you have what's called a 4473 or a firearms transaction record. So I'm not going to get into a ton of detail on the manufacturing side. That's almost a whole other video. We might do that later. But manufacturers, they have to follow a ton of freaking rules. They got to pay all these taxes. It, it's, it sucks, okay? And a lot of that tax gets passed on to you, the consumer. So there is a built-in amount of money into every gun purchase you make that is going to be ate up by taxes and regulatory fees and Pittman Robertson tax and all this other random crap, okay, which is it's just really just the government getting their protection money, going back to the whole mafia thing. That, that, that's what it all comes down to. All right, so you want to buy a gun. You saw the newest John Wick, and you go, wow, that's an awesome gun. I want to buy it. Um, contrary to popular belief, yes, you can buy guns on the Internet. It is totally legal. It is totally fine. It is totally normal, right? There's websites all over the place. You, you can go and window shop 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, in years past, that wasn't always an opportunity that we had, right? With the advent of the Internet and with the advent of social media, um, you know, hey, it, it, it's easy for a business to go, hey, we just got in 15 of this gun and make a little post and, you know, then people want to buy them. Where the big disconnect is, is that people think that you buy the gun and it just ships straight to your house and there's no paperwork or no, you know, nothing, right? It's just a simple transaction. You buy it like an underground or CD or, or unlawful or, you know, or, or, or kind of a shady underground transaction. That's not true. You can buy a gun online. So say you go to your favorite website, you saw the new John Wick. All right, you go to your favorite website. They've got the new John Wick gun. You're like, wow, staccato. You want to buy it. Okay, fine. You go on there, you, you add it to your cart, just like you're going to buy any other type of uh, item on, on the internet, uh, Amazon or whatever you were going to do. You pay for it. When you get in the checkout process, they're going to ask you for an FFL, a federal firearms license, right? That gun has to be transferred to an FFL holder in your area, okay? So let's say that uh, the staccato you're buying is uh, from a place in, I don't know, uh, Montana or whatever, whatever state, a state other than yours. Okay. You live. All right. Let's use me an example. I live in Georgia and I want to buy a staccato from a guy in Florida. All right. That's fine. Say it's a website in Florida that has the gun. I went through the checkout process. I checked out, I paid for the gun. They're going to go, okay, we need a 4473. All right. I'm sorry. A uh, FFL copy of the FFL, uh, for whoever's going to be doing the transfer. Now in my situation, we have our own FFL, so I would just provide a copy of my FFL to them, and then they would transfer that gun to me. And even though I, I own the FFL, or Chad and I do, even though we have our own FFL, I still have to fill out a 4473, even though it's my business, in order for me to transfer the gun from the FFL to me as an individual, and ultimately, just like you see all these guns behind me, into my personal collection. Okay, so you found the gun you want, you check out, you provide the 40, uh, the uh, FFL. So what you would do as a normal person trying to buy a gun, let's just say in another state and then have it shipped in, like in, which is usually the case with an online transaction. We're going to go to a brick and mortar store in a minute, but we're talking about online transactions right now. You would contact your local gun store. So let's say that you've got three or four gun stores in town and maybe there's one you've done business with before and you and they know you, you know them, and you just would rather deal with people that you know. So let's say in my situation... Let's say I didn't have my own FFL and I wanted to have Moss Pawn. Uh, well, I used to work at Moss. Let's say I had Moss do my transfer. Well, then I would contact Michelle and I would say, hey, Michelle, I need a copy of that Moss FFL because we're buying a gun or whatever, and I need to have it shipped in to your store. Uh, she would Usually, there's a couple of different ways they'll handle it. Sometimes the store will want to contact the person selling the gun directly and then handle the transfer of the documents that way. Sometimes... They'll just email you a copy of their 44 or their, I'm sorry, their, their FFL, which you will then forward to 
the party that you're buying the gun from. And then what they have is a thing called Easy Check. Um, Easy Check is a system where when you get an FFL in your hand, you can run the FFL through Easy Check. Most places run them through Easy Check. And what the Easy Check system does, it makes sure it's a real FFL. Okay. It makes sure that it's valid, that it's current, that the address that you've been given is current and all of that good sort of stuff. Because from a compliance standpoint, you don't want to send a gun to the wrong place. You're going to get in a boatload of trouble if you ever get audited. So the easy check system is a way for the recipient and the receiving party to ensure that the documents that they're getting in combination with the shipping of this gun are valid and current and correct and all of that good stuff. Easy check works both ways. So if let's say they at Moss were to get that gun in from the FFL in Florida and then log it into their books, they're going to check the FFL of the person sending the gun to ensure it's a correct FFL, it's current and all that sort of stuff. So easy check is for the recipient and for uh, the sender. All right. So all of that boring stuff out of the way, you get a phone call. Hey, your gun's here. All right, cool. My gun's here. You shimmy up to the gun shop as fast as you can because you can't wait to get your new gun. Of course, that new gun day, that's how it is. You hurry your butt up to the gun store and they go, and, and you go, oh, where's my gun? I want it. I want to leave with it right now. And they go, well, there's the unfortunate 4473 we have to contend with. So you have a 4473 that's attached to the gun purchase. So this is where a lot of people go wrong when they assume that, oh, well, you can just buy a gun online and have it shipped straight to you. That is not true. Everything from the transfer of the gun, as we discussed, the easy check system, the FFL system, and then now all the way to the actual firearms transaction record, the Form 4473. So the 4473 asks you a series of questions, and I'm not going to you know, bore you with all of the details, um, but I'll just, I will say that for those of you that have not bought a gun ever before, it can be a little bit of a daunting task, and I'll just tell you that you want to make sure you read it very carefully. Most of the questions are pretty straightforward, you know, and they're, they're pretty basic, but there are a few that, that if you don't read them right, you might answer wrong. So here's the weird thing about the 4473. If you have, let's just say, difficulty writing or you have difficulty comprehending and reading, I don't want you to think that you can't buy a gun. It is actually okay for the, in, the, the FFL holder to assist you with the form if you have, let's just say, a lack of reading and writing and comprehension ability. So don't think that just because you're not good with paperwork that you can't buy a gun. That's not true. They can help you. They just have to have somebody, a witness, sign off that they helped you. Now that's a, let's just remove that scenario from the door and let's just say, hey, I'm a normal dude that can read and write and comprehend reasonably well for a redneck and I'm going to fill this form out. You go through, so we'll go through each block. And um, so you have the transferee, which is you, the buyer. You're going to have your last name, first name, middle name. If you don't have a middle name, you put NMN as it shows you on the form. Um, you're going to put your, your number and street address. And what I do is I write it out precisely how it is on the driver's license. Okay, now I want to just provide a little caveat here that every business does it a little bit different. Now, the ATF will claim, oh, well, you have to do it this way or that way. And, and when they get audited, they might look at a form and go, well, you made an error because you did DR or, or you wrote the word drive out instead of putting DR and vice versa. So it's all up to the matter of consistency in terms of the FFL holder that you are filling out the 4473 for. I've gone in and filled out 4473s the way that I typically do them, and I've actually had a business say, hey, I need you to mark this out in initial because we prefer it this way. So if they want it consistently done a certain way, they will usually kind of tell you, hey, we want you to write it out this way. But the way I generally do it is, for instance, on the street address section, whatever is on the license, exactly how it's written. So a postal abbreviation, like some, some people will say you can't put an abbreviation on a 4473. That's not true. A postal abbreviation is an abbreviation. It is a legal document. That license is a legal document. And the way that that, if my street is blah, 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 drive with DR, then that is a postal abbreviation. You can put that. I digress. But again, you're going you're gonna to have some varying ideas about how people approach that. But I put whatever is on the dang license, okay? <clears throat> Your city, obviously, whatever city you live in. Again, this has to be your current address. It has to be where you lay your head at night, where you live. You have to have a current driver's license with your current address on it. 
A lot of people get this wrong, you know, they, and then they get mad when they go, well, I don't have a government issued ID that, and everything. So again, we look at, all right, all these people that say, well, it's, you know, it, it's terrible that people should have to have a driver's license and verified ID to vote or whatever, but no one wants to, oh, what about the gun owner? You, if you don't have a driver's license or a government issued document or a government issued ID with your current address and all that good stuff on it, you ain't buying a gun over the counter, period. You ain't. So people get all upset about, oh, we're requiring ID for voting, but yet you can't buy a gun. Like it's one of the, the strictest things there is when it comes to purchasing guns is that ID requirement. So anyway, your city, your county, um, your state, now, notice that the block for state is kind of tiny. Yeah, that's because you can put a postal abbreviation. So if you live in Georgia, you're going to put GA. It's simple. Your zip code, of course, your place of birth, U.S. city and state you were born in. There's all, you know, basically, look, go through and follow the directions and mark everything accordingly. I want to mention something about the, uh, the social. You notice here where it says social security number, optional, but it will help prevent my misidentification. Let's say that you have a name like John Smith, and it's a really common first name and a really common last name. Uh, once the 4473 is put through the NICS system, it goes through like an FBI background check, and they have auditors on their end that they'll do like kind of a quick, a quick push to see if anything comes back on you. That's essentially what this background check system does. And NICS is a system that law enforcement can plug certain individuals in uh, who have committed terrible crimes and things like that. It's supposed to be a system where, you know, if you've been in any domestic stuff or felonies or terrible crimes, you'll get dinged in the NICS system, in theory. Uh, of course, it, we'll, we'll get to that, but it doesn't always work properly. There's a lot of false denials. There's a lot of false proceeds. It's a very terrible system that it might catch some bad people, but at the end of the day, it it's a wide net with some really loose rings in it. Let's just put it that way. But I digress. One thing I'll mention about the social, I know people don't like putting their social down. If you got a real common name, and let's say you're at a, a gun shop and you want the, the background check to come back pretty quick, the social does help. If you put the social, there's no way that they're going to accidentally say, oh, you're the John Smith from Arkansas or the John Smith from Florida or, or, or the other billion John Smiths on the planet. It helps them identify you precisely and quickly when you give them the social. So, Personally, if you run a background check, I'd put the social. That's just me. I don't have a, a relatively common last name, so it's not a big deal for me. But if you have a real common last name, you probably want to put your social. Um, so you go through and answer the questions. And I'm not going to tell you the answers to the questions, but it, look, it's basic stuff. I mean, they're asking you a series of questions. Just say yes or no. Um, and it's it's pretty straightforward. So that's your 4473. You know, you date, you sign. Um, the gun store employee will then look it over. Normally at the gun shop, what they'll do is they'll have the employee that will sign off on, hey, I, I checked all of this uh, stuff to make sure that all the words were spelled properly, all the abbreviations were there that needed to be, all of the, you know, all the blocks were checked, any errors that were made, we, we corrected them and, 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 and did everything. So the employee will check off on it. And then usually each gun store will have a management uh, personnel or let's just say a manager that will then sign off on it as well. So that's them verifying that, yes, I checked what my employee did. The employee checked what the, what the customer did. And that way there's at least a chain of people that they can say, yes, we checked this over several times. And in the event of an audit uh, where the ATF looks over the documents and they check for errors or they check for, you know, any type of things like that, um, that would then give them a little bit of a reason to say, okay, well, we saw that you did your due diligence. I mean, the customer filled it out. Two of your people looked it over. Oh, you, you accidentally forgot to, to dot an I or cross a T. That's probably something that they're, you know, right now revocations are up like crazy. They could probably screw you up over that if they wanted to. But look, at the end of the day, people are people and people make human errors. And there are plenty of human errors on a 4473. I think what they're really looking for is just the due diligence. As long as someone's taken the due diligence and there's a system in place, you know, some gun stores will even have like a cover sheet that they'll put on their 4473s that that say, hey, I certify that I've looked at this, 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 and this, and they make the customer sign it. Kind of overboard. Some of, uh, some of them will also make a copy of your ID and everything like that, just so in case anything ever comes back up, you know, they can say, hey, this is the ID I had. Like, this is what it is. Like, they prove that you had the correct documentation, that you didn't just 
put in some random bogus address or something. So that's an over-the-counter firearms transaction. And when you go and buy a gun, so you do the 4473, they run the background check, okay? Background check comes back either proceed, delay, or deny. Those are your typical three responses. The, the transaction can be delayed up to three business days. Now, it's not a mandatory delay, all right? A lot of people think that, that every gun purchase is delayed. It's not. Some are instant, right? If you put your social security number down and you're, you're, uh, you come back instant, proceed. Green, green light, proceed instantly because you provided your social. And they ran a quick NIX plug and you came back green. Everything was good. No issues. Then you go to the counter with your form and your gun. You purchase whatever holster and ammo and gun and accessories and bull crap, whatever you want for your, your gun. And you take the dang gun and you walk out the store and you leave and it's yours and that's it. You know, so at the end of the day, it's it's pretty simple to get a gun, uh, but it's not as simple as they say it is. Now, one other thing I want to mention about the 4473 is the uh, background check requirement. If you have a carry permit, you don't have to have a background check. You still have to fill out the 4473 so that there's a disposition of the gun store to you. They have to track who they sold that gun to. They can't just go, well, this person had a permit, therefore, well, the gun's just lost in the nether now. All right, that that's not how it works. So you still fill out the 4473, but when you get to the part uh, down below about the background check, there's a separate block where they can go, hey, th this person has a permit. Then they take your permit, they write down your permit number and the date, expiration date, and all that good stuff. Excuse me. And usually when they take a picture or a photo scan of your ID, they'll usually take a photo scan of the carry permit as well. So they won't run the background check. The carry permit is your background check. The carry permit is like saying, hey, this person's already been through a check. They're good. As long as the carry permit is current, you buy the gun, you leave. That's it. And they, all they have is a record that you purchased it and, and there was no background check ever required. I like that. And there's a lot of people, you know, don't get me wrong. I understand that there's people that want constitutional carry. And I think, look, constitutional carry is a fantastic thing. We should support it 110%. However, I've always kind of felt like I kind of want to get the gun license too, just because if I have a carry license, it just makes buying guns easier. You know, I can go in. I don't have to worry about getting delayed. What if I'm at a gun show? All right. Here's another. We'll talk about gun shows. Right. Everybody talks about the gun show loophole. Well, here's where it gets a little slippery. So... Say I go to a gun show, and it's a local Georgia gun show right here. Let's say I'm a couple of hours from home, and I drove to this big gun show to check out stuff. So you have individuals that have tables that bring their personal collections in to sell, and then you have businesses that bring things in to sell. So let's say that if I ran a big gun store, I would go get some tables at a gun show and put all my wares out there, and then basically, I'm still running a gun shop. I'm just at a gun show. I'm at a separate location instead of my physical location. But my requirements to, to do a 4473 are the same. I still have to dispose of that gun in the same way. So let's say that I'm running a, a gun show counter as a gun store person. Well, then someone comes up and, hey, I want to buy this gun. Okay, fine. Here's your 4473. That process is the same as an over-the-counter firearms transaction record. Um, you're just you're going to buy it at a gun show at a separate location instead of the physical location of the gun store. But that's why having the carry permit is important because what if you're at a gun show and you get you know a, a, a delay? Now you have to deal with the minutia of well, holy crap! What am I going to do? Drive back two hours a day later when it comes back? So it's just it, it it makes it a lot logistically a lot easier to have the carry permit because I can go to a gun show and know that if there's something I want to buy from a dealer that I can buy it, and I know I'm going to leave with it that day, and all is well. All right, now, what about individuals? All right, well, here's where it gets a little bit different. So once a firearm leaves a gun store, it is your property to do with however you see fit, to a degree. Now, it is probably very important that you not sell a gun to somebody that is a piece of crap. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. You know, you, you don't want to, you want to be careful who you sell a gun to. Uh, because ultimately that, that transaction, let's say that, all right, here's a good example. Let's say that I go to a gun, gun store and I buy a firearm and then I take it home. And let's say a month later I go, yeah, I shot this thing a bit. It, it's cool, but 
doesn't really fit my hand right, or I don't like it, or for whatever reason, you, you've decided, I don't want this gun anymore. I want to get rid of it. Your options are you can either go back to a gun store and just sell it to them, sell it back, and probably get hosed, honestly, because they'll usually only give you about 60% of what it's worth. Uh, and they're going to put it out and make themselves a nice fat profit on it because they don't care how long it takes to sell. They don't have to feed it, but you want to get rid of your gun. So I wouldn't recommend selling guns to a gun store because unless you know the people really well and they, and they take care of you and you do a lot of business with them, you're going to get hosed on that. Your other option is to sell it to an individual. Here's where gun shows get a little weird. So I could go as an individual and I could take a whole bunch of my guns to a gun show if I wanted to. And I could, I could um, rent my tables. You know, usually at a gun, a gun show, each table is a certain price. Like it might only be $15 per table or $20 per table. But I might need three or four tables. So I'm paying 80 bucks to be there. And then, of course, I'm having to pay, you know, probably a fee to the venue in order to be there. But beyond that, let's just say I'm an individual and I go get some tables at a gun show. And I want to lay out my, some of my collection and sell it to who the heck ever comes up and, and, and wants to buy them. I can do that legally. But, you know, it it just kind of becomes a little bit of a weird situation. You don't really know who the heck you're selling a gun to, okay? And I think that it comes down to the individual being really kind of smart about, you know, who the heck you're going to sell a gun to. I mean, if someone walks up and they smell like liquor and weed, you probably don't need to sell that gun to that person. That's on you because at the end of the day, if there's a 4473 disposition in your name in that gun and say you sell that gun to somebody and it's wound up getting used in a crime, does that mean that you committed a crime? Well, here's where it gets kind of interesting. No, you're not committing a crime. But if you knowingly sold the gun to somebody you know wasn't supposed to have it, that's called a straw purchase, and that is committing a crime in their eyes. Um, firearms are not registered. They are traceable, and that's what the 4473 accomplishes. So just because you fill out a 4473, well, it's actually been proven that the ATF does have a database of 4473s. Oh, the search function doesn't work. We don't, we don't have the search function. Okay, whatever. It's a database. Call it whatever you want. If you fill out a 4473 in recent years, chances are you are in a database. Now, is it innocuous and, and probably not a big deal? Maybe. But then again, it could also be used for nefarious purposes. In the future, they could say, well, we want to round up guns. And they could say, well, anybody who's, who's done a 4473, we have their address, their name, uh, description of them, the gun they bought, the serial number, et cetera. Uh, and now we can go over there and demand this gun or whatever. So that's the issue with the registry. But technically, the ATF is not allowed to maintain a registry. The government is not allowed to maintain a registry on firearms. Okay, so, but it can be traced. Okay, so let's say that you went to a gun show and you sold a gun to somebody and then two weeks later, they went and committed a crime with that gun and then somehow said, well, screw it, and left it at the scene. Let's say the police found a gun at the scene, there's a murder, there's a crime, whatever, whatever the crime may be, they can now take that gun and go, oh, okay, well, here's a gun. And they can, what they're going to do is they're going to go back to the manufacturer. So say it's a, I don't know, a Glock, whatever, a Glock 19 that they found that you sold at a gun show. They're going to go back to Glock, and they're going to go, hey, we've got, a, we've got a gun here, serial number, make, model, yada, yada, yada. Glock is going to go, okay, here's who we sold it to. We, we sold it to Davidson's Distributor, or we sold it to Chattanooga Shooting Sports, or we sh sold it to Brownells, or whatever big supplier buys guns in bulk directly from the company like Glock. All right, well, then the law enforcement is going to go, all right, well, we're going to go have a chat with these people. Then they're going to go to those people. And those people are going to go, oh, uh, well, we sold uh, 20 of these to Bob's Gun and Pawn and blah, 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 whatever. They're going to trace that gun from where it was manufactured to where it was sold to a distributor, then where it was sold from the distributor to the gun store, and ultimately where it was sold from the gun store to you. And that will come back to you in the end. And then, of course, then they're going to have this bloody gun going, you got some explaining to do about how this gun wound up in Chicago on the street in, in a crime. So, look, I'm one of the people that, I believe strongly in personal liberty and personal freedom, and I believe that most people are inheritedly good people, especially folks that buy a lot of guns on a regular basis. I mean, most gun owners that you're going to run into are some of the most salt of the earth, awesome people you will ever meet in your life. That is a fact. That is a promise. Most of us are awesome people that are not in, ever intent on doing any harm 
or committing any crimes or, or doing anything terrible to anybody. A lot of people love guns from the standpoint of the mechanical, um, you know, the interesting mechanical properties, how they work, the history of them. So there's a lot of reasons to, to love guns, you know. Um, people like to hunt and, uh, you know, target shoot and do long-range shooting competitions and three-gun competitions, and people like to be able to protect themselves against a tyrannical government if it comes down to it. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for someone to own a gun, to defend your home, your life, your property, your family, your community, ultimately your country. So I'm never going to sit here and say, oh, well, I agree with this system or I think this system is perfect or that this is the way that it should be from here on out. I'm just merely reporting this is how firearms are purchased in the United States. This is how people buy guns. It is legal for an individual in most states. Again, that's another thing to mention. Every state's a little different. Some states have much stricter laws on private purchase, on even firearms purchases over the counter. So you have to know your state's rules. Every rule is a little bit different. Some states don't allow certain guns to be sold in their state. Like if you're in California, there's a California roster for handguns. There's only certain handguns you can buy. There's obviously like assault weapons bans in certain states where, okay, well, you can't have an AR-15 with a 30-round magazine in it in this state because the state passed a state-level law that says uh, that those types of guns are banned or that a magazine capacity or there's a certain restriction on certain components, things like that. So you have to deal with that. That's the unfortunate byproduct of it. My view of it as a guy that lives in Georgia is very different than a view of it of someone that lives in California or the places that we would consider anti-gun uh, states and everything like that. So you need to understand your local laws, your local ordinances, your local state laws, and understand the federal laws as well. So unfortunately, it sucks. Uh, the, the firearms world is, is heavily re regulated. It's one of the most regulated industries in the United States. And um, it's also one of the most controversial. I mean, look, look at all the talks about gun control that happen all the time. And, you know, there's one, there's two very different thought processes for how guns should be treated in the United States with two very different extremes. Uh, I tend to find myself more on the, uh, on the level of, uh, you know, I want total and, and, and unabated uh, gun ownership for everybody, uh, regardless of race, religion, creed, background, sexual preference or any of that. Like, I, I'm just the kind of guy that, hey, more guns we have, the better off we'll be ultimately because everyone can stand on equal ground and protect themselves and protect their communities and be safer for it and to feel the, the, the feeling that is uh, being able to defend yourself and knowing that you are well protected in your home and protect your property and your family and your, your belongings and, and your life ultimately. So, Many of us view it on that, you know, sort of almost a spiritual level in a way, like more of a, a Zen level of holistic protection, human rights. I, I look at the, the right to bear arms as being a very holistic and important natural human right that should never be denied of any person. Um, but that's the lay of the land. That's how things stand now. So a lot of people are asking me, hey, how do you buy guns? Um, that's, that's how you buy guns. Now, there's also, you can make guns. Now, that actually doesn't require anything. You can 3D print guns. It is not illegal to make your own firearm. Now, in terms of the NFA, or let's just look at the, you know, the various gun control laws that we have in the country that are currently on the books that hopefully Bruin will change the standard for that, the Supreme Court case, the Bruin case, will change the standards for that so that maybe in the future we won't have to deal with this kind of craziness but as it stands right now, as long as the configuration of the gun that you build is in a what they consider a legal configuration, right? There's overall length requirements, there's barrel length requirements, and all of this sort of stuff that I'm not going to get into in this particular video. But let's just say that you can legally make your own firearm if you have the know-how to do it. And it is perfectly legal uh, activity that people have been doing for centuries. It's nothing new. People have been making their own guns as long as people have lived on this continent. And the Second Amendment does give you the ability to make your own firearm. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, so those are how you get, that's how you get guns in the United States. Um, also, I'll, I'll quickly mention one more, one more way you, you could probably get, I mean, obviously people steal them. People steal guns. And that's a huge problem, right? I, I, I think it's important that people protect their gun collections really well, that you keep them locked up, you know, that you make sure that, you know, just because you have a lot of guns doesn't mean someone, you know, I mean, look at what's behind me right now. 
I wouldn't want somebody getting a hold of those because I wouldn't want these guns just being out there, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So it's important that you have a good gun safe. You know, obviously I, I've talked about gun storage a lot in previous videos, so I'm going to defer you to some of those videos, but you want to make sure that you're keeping your guns in a secure location. You don't want to have your guns get stolen because that's a very, very crappy situation. For one, nobody wants to have something stolen. It's a terrible feeling. Nobody wants to get robbed. But two, when it's a gun, oh my gosh, it's so much more stressful. You do not want to have a gun stolen because you have to report it to the police and you have to make models, serial number, all this stuff. Chances are you may not even get it back even if they find it. It, it just sucks. For the love of God, do not let your gun get stolen. It's not good, especially if it's an NFA item. It's a nightmare, and you don't want to have to deal with it. Um, the other thing that I'll mention quickly before we leave uh, here today for this video is that uh, also inheriting guns is a way that many Americans get guns. Uh, I have guns in my collection that belong to my great-grandfather. Uh, I have guns that belong to my grandfather. So... Uh, it is totally legit and normal and, and, and good to go if you inherit guns from a relative that has passed on. Uh, that's one way that a lot of people end up with a, a decent gun collection. And sometimes people will get a gun collection, you know, someone will pass away and leave them 50 guns or 60 guns or some quantity of firearms, and maybe they're not a gun person, okay? And they go, well, well gosh, what do I do with these? I, I don't want them, but I don't also don't want them in my house, and I, you know, want to get rid of them so they're not a liability. I mean, look, it's okay to recognize that it's a liability and that maybe you should get rid of them if you don't want them. Look, it's okay. No one's saying you got to have a gun if you don't want to have a gun, but if you find a deceased relative who has left you 50 guns and you're like, what the heck do I do with them? Um, there are a lot of ways that you can get rid of them. Um, I'd go to a gun show and just sell, sell the heck out of them and get rid of them personally. That's just me. That's how you're going to get top dollar. There's also auction sites. Uh, such as GunBroker. You can list them on GunBroker with as detailed of a description and good pictures as you possibly can and just kind of let them ride for a penny and just let let, let, the, let the hammer determine the price. Uh, you can do that. Uh, auctioning them is, is, is an option. Uh, you can always just load all 50 of them up and take them to a gun store and say, hey, what will you give me for them? And just roll the dice and, and hope that you're not going to get someone that's a turd uh, that's going to take advantage of you. That's probably the least uh, advisable situation that you do, um, you know, they're, they're going to take you to the cleaners on that. Uh, I, I can just trust me. Don't, don't sell them to a gun store. I would auction them or sell them to individuals or maybe talk to family and friends that want them and try to try to sell them that way. Uh, but that's just one thing I want to mention is, you know, sometimes with inheritances, um, you know, folks are dealing with gun collections that they don't know how to get rid of. So that, that's probably just something to keep in the back of your mind. But hopefully this video pointed some in, in the right direction. I was trying to be kind of generic and not go into like a ton of detail, but, but try to concentrate on the details that a newbie would really need to know when it comes to buying a gun over the counter and some of the things on the form. So maybe if you watch this video, now you have a little bit of an idea about what the form looks like so that when you go in, maybe you're not surprised and you'll be able to go in armed with a little bit better knowledge to conduct a uh, quick, simple, uh, an easy transaction so you can get your firearms and go about your day. So thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I was trying to, you know, put out some information. We get this question all the time. Make sure that you are subscribed to our channel and you click that notification bell so you get every single video. Also, we've done a bunch of other great videos that are tailored towards beginners, right? I've got, you know, all sorts of videos that will help you in your journey of uh, being a new gun owner. So check them out. I'll try to put some links in the description box below. I've got one on like basic gun maintenance. I've got one on um, shot shotgun identification, like uh, identifying shotgun shells and different, you know, shotgun calibers. I've done ones on like carry ammo versus ball ammo. Um, we've done some ones on, you know, different action types. So if you're wanting to learn more about gun technology and just, you know, some of the ins and outs of being a new gun owner, um, our channel is a great resource for that. So make sure you check it out and uh, get some information. It's free information. It's there for you to watch. So I, I make these videos as a service to try to help the internet community at large in their journey to become a gun owner. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much. Many more on the way. We'll see you soon.